Please welcome Dr. Sanaz Masumi. Our next keynote speaker is a general internist and clinical epidemiologist who serves as the director of the Center for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. His career has been dedicated to disseminating and implementing research evidence into clinical practice to support patient care and quality and safety. His work has been supported by AHRQ, PCORI, CDC, and NIH, and described in over 125 peer-reviewed publications. Please welcome Dr. Craig Omshide. Well, before I begin, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Masumi, uh, Dr. Ramsey, uh, and the uh, uh, team who invited me to speak today. It's a real honor and pleasure. This is the first time that I've been at a Patient Safety Movement Foundation meeting, uh, so it's, it's been wonderful to get to know so many in this community. What I've been asked to speak about today is uh, the National Action Alliance for Patient and Workforce Safety that our Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality is leading on behalf of the Department of Health and Human Services in the US. So like any good safety and quality talk, I'm gonna start with the data to uh, set up the context for this. So obviously prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we were seeing progress in patient safety uh, despite all of the opportunities we still have to improve. And this slide is just uh, one example of that. This is from our team at ARC from a study we published in JAMA in 2022. It examined adverse events for about 300,000 adult inpatients in the U.S. from 2010 to 2019. And you can see reductions in adverse events for those admitted for some of the most common conditions um, in inpatient services like acute myocardial infarction, pneumonia, major surgical procedures, heart failure. You see in this graph here, um, the number of adverse events per thousand discharges. And if you just look at, let's say the orange line uh, or the brown line right, but right below it, you can see that uh, the changes over the decade were quite significant and meaningful from about 200 adverse events per thousand discharges to uh, about 120 adverse events in 2019. So those are real changes. Those are real progress that, that's being made in the inpatient setting. But we all know despite improvements, uh, patient safety issues persist and they were exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and I have on this slide a couple studies that we've heard about here today. The first is uh, the Office of the Inspector General report uh, from the Department of Health and Human Services from May 2022 that analyzed Medicare inpatients from October 2018 and found that 25% experienced harm. One of the challenges with that finding was that the OIG did a similar analysis 10 years prior and found almost the exact same adverse event rate, 27% of patients experiencing harm in a similar analysis in October 2008. So not a lot of progress based on that report. We also have this study from David Bates that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2023 uh, that, as um, was shared earlier today, looked at hospitals in the state of Massachusetts in calendar year 2018, found that 25% of admissions had an adverse event, 7% of those admissions had a preventable adverse event. And then Lee Fleischer and colleagues from CMS in a uh, perspective in New England Journal of Medicine 2022 lamented that a lot of the progress that was made in the five years before the pandemic, such as the 30% reductions in central line associated bloodstream infections that we saw were practically erased during the pandemic. So we saw an increase in collapses uh, of 28% in quarter two 2020 compared with quarter two 2019. So progress has happened, but it's been slow and the pandemic has um, put us behind. And for those reasons, uh, many of you may recall and may have been at this hybrid event in the fall of 2022 that Secretary Javier Becerra had uh, from the Department of Health and Human Services. It was a call to action and it was a recommitment to patient and workforce safety. Uh, the federal agencies were there and ARC was asked to lead the charge. In January of 2023, our agency put out a request for information to the public to help us better understand how federal agencies could help support this effort. 
In March of 2023, our National Advisory Council at ARC, which is essentially our board, uh, charged a subcommittee to come up with recommendations for how ARC, along with agencies in the Department of Health and Human Services, could advance safety nationally. That uh, set of recommendations was presented to us in November 2023, uh, and we've been off to the races since trying to operationalize those recommendations. Now, one thing that I wanted to flag is that uh, those recommendations by the subcommittee were informed by not just uh, the public comments we received from the request for information, but also by seminal work that's been done by major organizations around patient safety, including the PCAST report, which has been referenced here, that came out in September 2023. So what are the aims of this new National Action Alliance for Patient and Workforce Safety? Well, there are five aims, and they're depicted in this figure here, and they're listed on the slide. And I'll go through them quickly, just to give you a sense of what we're focused on. So the overarching aim, which you see in this figure here as um, arching over the arched window, is uh, that healthcare systems should advance their patient safety strategies by using safety self-assessments. And we particularly like to spotlight the safety self-assessment from the National Action Plan that came out in 2020 that focuses on the four foundational areas of patient safety, which you may all know well, which is culture, patient engagement, workforce safety, and supporting learning systems. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So that's the first aim, supporting safety self-assessments at the system level. The second aim is empowering the patient voice and safety strategy. And this can take a number of different forms. Some of the approaches that the subcommittee recommended are listed here. So for example, patients and families being able to submit safety events through healthcare system incident reporting systems. Patients and families being included in their safety event review or being engaged in safety initiatives in healthcare systems. And also healthcare systems supporting communication and resolution programs, which gives clinical teams the ability to sensitively and transparently disclose medical errors that occur to patients. The third aim of the National Action Alliance is supporting the healthcare workforce by making healthcare safer by design. And the subcommittee specifically asked us to identify five high priority safety engineering issues that we could help address. The fourth aim is supporting healthcare workforce by strengthening safety competencies. And that's developing, adopting, and reporting those safety competencies for all members of the healthcare community, from board members to clinical and administrative leaders to clinical and non-clinical staff. And the fifth aim, which is the foundation of this figure, is facilitating learning and research networks. So encouraging learning and sharing across healthcare systems. And we heard a bit about that earlier today, uh, about how COVID has opened up sharing across healthcare systems. Uh, spotlighting change leaders, promoting robust measurement across systems. Uh, we particularly heard that from our colleagues at uh, Baylor, Scott & White. And then supporting research to address the highest priority safety needs. So to accomplish the first aim of the National Action Alliance, uh, we have spotlighted the 2020 National Action Plan for Safety. So this was a plan, as many of you may know, uh, that was put together by about 30 lead, leading key stakeholders in patient safety across the U.S. It was co-chaired by IHI and ARC, um, and the National Action Plan identifies four foundational areas for safety, which you see here on this slide. And there's also an associated safety self-assessment that goes along with the National Action Plan, as many of you may know, that healthcare systems can use to understand for each of the foundational areas how well are they doing? So for each of the foundational areas, the safety self-assessment has about five to seven criteria that healthcare systems can assess. And I've listed some examples on this slide here. So for example, in the culture, leadership, and governance foundational area, does the hospital promote regular safety culture surveys that they act on? For the patient and family engagement foundational area, are there actively engaged patient and family advisory committees that engage in safety and quality work? For the workforce safety issue, does a healthcare system have an explicit worker safety strategy that's communicated to the whole healthcare workforce? 
And the fourth uh, foundational area, learning healthcare systems. One example is, does the healthcare system have defined safety competencies for all workers? So who is the National Action Alliance? So my hope is that all of us here in this room represent the National Action Alliance. And I'll tell you specifically who, who we've been working most closely with uh, over this past calendar year to operationalize this, uh, this set of recommendations from our subcommittee. So our federal partners have been absolutely key. And I think for me, one of the big benefits of this alliance is coming together with our partners, particularly in HHS, that includes CMS, CDC, along with other sister agencies like the Office of National Coordinator of Health IT, HRSA, FDA, as well as other non-HHS federal agencies like VA, DOD. So we've gotten together our federal agencies and have aligned around our safety strategy, and that's allowed us to synergize our efforts. And I'll say more to that in just a minute. On the other side of this figure, we have our National Steering Committee for Patient Safety. So this is the steering committee that originally wrote the 2020 National Action Plan for Patient Safety and is still around and thriving. I co-chair it along with my uh, co-chair Patricia McGaffigan at IHI. We have well over 30, 30 organizations on this National Steering Committee now, including groups like Patients for Patient Safety US, the American Hospital Association, LeapFrog Joint Commission, and many others. And this committee acts as an important sounding board for our work, but also communicates our work back to their member organizations, which is critical. And obviously, healthcare provider organizations across all settings are really where the rubber meets the road in this National Action Alliance. Our target has been to reduce patient and workforce harm by 50% by 2026 from the peak of the pandemic. This is an audacious goal, but it's one that the subcommittee recommended we take on. And our ultimate vision is safe care everywhere, zero preventable harm for all. So this is how we've operationalized our work over these last uh, number of months. We focused quite a bit on healthcare provider organizations, particularly through our partners like the American Hospital Association, AAMC, uh, Joint Commission, and many other member groups. Uh, to facilitate commitments to safety self-assessments, and also to recruit high performers who we can spotlight in webinars uh, to feature different opportunities to, to support patient safety. We've also put together an engineering safe practices affinity group of experts to help us identify high priority opportunities in this space and work collaboratively to implement solutions. And I'll say more about that in a minute. And we've implemented a patient safety competencies affinity group to help us review patient safety competencies uh, for different professional groups like nurses, physicians, healthcare administrators, and patient and quality professionals to ensure that safety competencies are robust and they're getting trained uh, in a robust way. This is the group of experts we have on our engineering safe practices affinity group. As you can see here, this is a um, group of uh, national experts, and it's a diverse group across many different settings. So we have nursing represented, human factors, engineering, the American Hospital Association, uh, ECRI Institute Joint Commission, American Medical Association, pharmacy, and many others. This is our patient safety competencies affinity group. Uh, and as you can see here, we have groups from uh, uh, representing physicians, um, uh, healthcare, uh, uh, American College of Healthcare Executives for our healthcare administrators, uh, IHI and NACU for our, uh, patient safety and quality professionals, and nursing associations. And so, how are we accomplishing our work? So, we're asking healthcare systems to do this safety self assessment mostly so that they can identify opportunities to strengthen safety in their organization and then draw on tools and other resources we have available in the federal government and through our private partners to help them address those opportunities and strengthen safety. The National Action Alliance engine is that purple box that you see on the slide. And the set of tools that we have uh, include national webinars. We support implementation initiatives across the US. Uh, we have tools and resources uh, on a single site from all of our federal agencies that help organizations address those foundational areas of safety. 
Uh, we have funding opportunities available, and we have sets of measures and a safety dashboard. And our, help, our hope is that this helps learning healthcare organizations identify and implement best practices, learn from each other, have novel research supported, and all of this aligns with value-based care, which I'll show in just a moment. So these are some examples of tools, funding opportunities, and implementation initiatives available from ARC. Uh, again, ARC is just one of many groups who are part of this National Action Alliance. But you see in the culture, leadership, and governance, we support surveys on patient safety culture. We have improvement tools to help healthcare systems improve uh, their patient safety culture. And currently, we're supporting an initiative across the U.S. to implement safety cultures in nursing homes for any of you who are interested. For the patient and family engagement, we have Team Steps 3.0. It's a brand new revised Team Steps. The last time it was revised was a decade ago. Uh, we now have virtual and in-person training on this suite of tools to improve communication and collaboration between teams and teams and patients and their families. For workforce safety, we have a brand new funding opportunity from ARC. It's the first time we're funding uh, best practices to improve patient safety by improving healthcare worker safety and well-being. And for learning systems, we support the ARC Patient Safety Net, which is a one-stop shop for patient safety resources. Patrick Romano is here in the room who helps lead that initiative. If you want to learn more, please talk to Patrick about the tool. And this is how all of this work aligns. Uh, so many of you may know the CMS Patient Safety Structural Measure that will be going live in calendar year 2025. And as many of you may be able to see on this slide, there is deep synergy between the National Action Alliance and this patient safety structural measure. And that is not by chance, that is by design. Uh, so hospitals will be expected to attest to these different criteria in the patient safety structural measure. And will be another incentive to leverage these tools to ensure that safety is as strong as possible in their healthcare systems. We're also standing up a national healthcare safety dashboard, which will launch uh, this fall. Uh, we will be tracking patient safety measures from across the US, including patient safety indicators, uh, Medicare adverse events, uh, culture of safety survey measures, and others. And these measures, uh, for many of them, will be able to stratify them uh, by different patient populations, such as by race and ethnicity, so that we can ensure that progress that's being made is not just national progress, but it's across all patient cohorts. So if you'd like to learn more about the National Action Alliance, we have a robust website set up uh, where we have information about the Alliance, uh, access to our webinars. Our next webinar will be on World Patient Safety Day about our diagnostic safety resources. Uh, we have information about our National Healthcare Safety Dashboard that will soon to be live. And we have information about how to get engaged and how to be involved. So thanks for the opportunity to share this Action Alliance with you all. And I'm happy to take any questions offline. Thanks.